Um, the answer was that we m may see very significant um, extinctions due to climate change on the order of 20 or 30 percent of species uh, that were simulated in modeling efforts all around the world. So Towns Lab was involved in modeling efforts in Mexico. Um, Guy Midgley and I had done models in South Africa. I don't know what, half a dozen or not quite a dozen labs in other parts of the world had all done species distribution modeling. All of us had seen that some species seemed to lose all of their suitable climate, which had raised the question of possible extinction with us. And then uh, we teamed up with Chris Thomas, then at the University of Leeds, uh, to look at um, if we used some ways of estimating extinction risk uh, from our models, what our conclusions would be. And the conclusion was that uh, the considerable percentages of species up to 30 or 40 percent might become extinct due to climate change. And now I will show you, and this, and so that research was published in the journal Nature. It was the cover story. Uh, Nature wanted to know what species in particular might be th threatened with extinction. The Boyd's forest dragon was one of the species that the model suggested might have a high risk of extinction due to climate change. And so Boyd's forest dragon wound up on the cover of Nature. And then I'm going to show you very briefly a really boring table of the results that we obtained. Uh, but the things to note here are the models that that were run in Towns Lab and our labs and others covered a wide range of, of taxa from mammals to birds, frogs, reptiles, butterflies, other invertebrates, and plant species. So it covered a large uh, variety of settings across the globe from South Africa to Mexico to Australia. Uh, it wasn't systematically selected, but it covered a broad range of geographies covered a broad range of taxa and resulted in a broad range of extinction risk estimates. But uh, if you took sort of mid-range extinction risk estimates, you were seeing sort of 30 to 40 percent extinction risk. And then Chris Thomas took a bold move, which was to estimate or take estimates of how many species there are on Earth and ask, well, if you lost 20 or 30 percent of them, how many species would that be? Well, um, there are roughly five or 10 million species on the planet. And if you take, say, 30 percent of fi either five or 10 million, you wind up with well over a million species that might be at risk of extinction due to climate change. And so that was the headline that came out of that nature paper which was that the, there could be a million species at risk of extinction due to climate change. So it got front page coverage in the UK, uh, in the US and other places. I think these are all US newspapers, but it got a considerable press coverage around the world and ha had considerable political influence as well. The study's results were discussed in the uh, Houses of Parliament in the UK. There were hearings in the US Senate. So. Uh, one of the really important results of species distribution modeling of climate change was the conclusion that s very significant numbers of species may be at extinction risk from climate change and that it's important both to do something about climate change to reduce that extinction risk and some of that discussion is going on right now in Paris but also that it's important to adapt conservation strategies to try and help species get through the periods of climate change. Town? Question, answer. I, I just have to say, uh, and we can debate this later if you want, mm. or maybe not, but several of the authors of that paper felt that the lead author vastly overstated the evidence that we had and seemingly did so simply because this publicity would result. Uh -huh. And so I actually found myself giving interviews to some of those same in in newspapers speaking against the results or the interpretation of the results uh -huh. of a study on which I was an author. Yeah. Uh, well, that's a, a very long story, it but is. is an interesting... Uh, so 
let's tell the short version of that story. There was a lot of controversy about the, the results of this paper, and that controversy stemmed from that estimate that Chris Thomas uh, made, not in the paper, but actually in the press release about the story, arriving at the million species number. Um, and Town, I think, thought that that was an overestimate. Um, I, I, I thought it was an overinterpretation. It was, yes, it was. Very sparse evidence that we had right. at the time. So it was taking our results a step further. I did it in a way that, the, the, that helped interpret it to, to ordinary people. So communications people would probably say that it was a good thing to do. Scientists didn't necessarily feel that it was a good thing to do. And then the whole process of the media reporting on it uh, resulted in, in confusion. For instance, and one of, the most, one of the most famous controversies about this is that many of the headlines said 37% um, of species will be extinct by 2050. Well, that wasn't what our research showed at all. We used climate change scenarios for 2050, but the methods we use, the species area relationship method that we use to estimate extinction, doesn't s say anything about when the extinction will happen. So saying that, a s certain, that the species that we were saying were at risk of extinction would be extinct by 2050 was completely wrong. And we explained that over and over again to reporters. And if you read the, the reports about the research, most of the reporters got it right, actually. Most of the reporters said that it was a climate scenario of, of 2050, and it projected extinctions. They often didn't say, we don't know when those extinctions would occur. But they generally had the wording right in the, in the article itself. But then the people who write articles aren't the people who write headlines. So the headline guys just wanted a who, what, when, and where in their headline. And so they went ahead and stuck the, the 2050 into the headlines. And the authors of the paper, Town and I both included, came in for a lot of criticism for that. But I frankly don't see any way that we could have controlled that. But there were also people, including some of the scientists involved in the study, who felt that a million species was an overestimate or sort of an over-extrapolation from some very s sparse and scattered percentage extinction uh, risk estimates we've had. Um, having said that, though, um, there's been a limited number of studies that have tried to corroborate these results. And in general, I think those studies have suggested the same thing, which, they're, it, which is that there are very significant extinction risks associated with climate change. Now, whether it's a million species or 30 percent, uh, or whether we're looking at the hot spots or just lizards, um, the, the details may change a little bit. But it's pretty clear that there are real reasons to be concerned about extinction risks from climate change. And if anything, the greatest reason is the fact that land use change has changed so much. We know that in the past, if you think back to what we were talking about in paleoecology, species were moving in response to climate change across entire continents that were essentially fully natural or at least friendly to species movements. And that's not the case anymore. Now we've got continents that have heavy industrial agriculture in places, small scale, smallholder agriculture that's not friendly to species movements. And so species, are, as they try and move in response to climate change, are going to run into some real hard barriers, cities, agricultural land. Um, and that elevates extinction risks greatly. Interestingly, I don't know of any great studies of that particular aspect of this, but uh, I think anybody who's in this field would tell you that's probably the, the biggest concern about extinction risk from climate change. Bilal. So, but I think it's also important to note that there is tremendous variation within continents and across continents mm -hmm. of the degree of species yep. risk from climate change. And yep. I think that sometimes gets glossed over in these broad debates. Yep. And one of the things, and one of the reasons that happens is because we're still trying to get action on climate change. And as a result, a lot of discussion of biology uh, and other things gets elevated to the global level where we're looking at global mean temperature or the number of extinctions across the entire planet. 
which are important metrics for the policymakers who are in Paris right now debating climate change, but for us biologists are kind of irrelevant. What we care about is the specific extinction risk of the species we're worried about in the place where we work or the region where we work. And uh, hopefully one day the world will get behind some good climate policy. We can dispense with a lot of the, the simplistic global numbers and get down to business in individual areas uh, looking at the uh, risk of individual species and individual land use settings. Um, so just quickly to a um, couple other things in, in this respect. There are other ways to look at uh, potential extinction risk from climate change. The IUCN who does the uh, threatened species red list rather than use species modeling decided to look at the traits of species that make them vulnerable to climate change and this is just a short slide to illustrate that work. Here are a number of species traits that uh, IUCN defined as relevant to whether species might be at extinction risk due to climate change. And then on the, this axis is the importance to extinction risk of that particular factor. So the occupied area, if you have a tiny area, you can be very vulnerable to extinction from climate change. So that gets a, a big uh, bar in this graph bar, population size important and then you know you get down to trend and connectivity and fragmentation and some other things which they judge to not be very important in extinction risk for climate change. Um, you have to, to wonder, <laughs> wonder about what some of these are. Trend in fractal dimension. Town, maybe you can explain that to us. I don't know what that one is. But at any rate, the IUCN engaged in, instead of a modeling effort in an expert opinion uh, exercise. And in fact, Wendy Foden, the same student who did the allo dichotomer work, led the trait based assessment for IUCN. And they assessed uh, um, 10,000 birds and herps. They didn't assess all, uh, all taxa, uh, but they concentrated on birds and uh, I believe some marine species, corals, um, to come up with some estimates of ex uh, extinction risk due to climate change. And those are being used by the IUCN specialist group, so it feeds into the red, red listing process. <coughs> and then finally, where, where are the species at risk? Is it uh, high latitude, are there a lot of high latitude species that may go extinct because ice is melting? Um, where in the world are, are the species at risk? Well, this is one way of looking at, that, at this. Other authors have used other ways. Uh, but this was just a, um, an analysis we did of bird species with very narrow uh, thermal niches. Uh, we basically looked at their elevation range as a surrogate for their thermal niche, which means that they can only exist in a narrow climatic band, which means that they're vulnerable. And then we asked where those species existed, and those species are primarily in the tropics. So you can see this is restricted range birds with narrow thermal niches and where they are in the world. There is a huge number of them in the Andes. There are a lot in the Afro-Montane. There are quite a few here in the Horn of Africa. Uh, significant numbers scattered through Asia. Uh, but there are very few actually, and this is just because there aren't, you know, there are far more species in the tropics than at high latitudes. It doesn't mean that species aren't threatened in the high latitudes, but there aren't very many of them. And very few of them have narrow thermal niches because these species are used to big annual temperature and uh, other climatic fluctuations anyway. So um, while we've seen that the temperature changes are a little less in the tropics, the number of species at risk are, are great in the tropics, which means that overall the tropics is one of the places to be most concerned about uh, extinction risk from climate change and adapting our cl conservation strategies for climate change. So uh, it must be uh, pushing on dinner time, so I think we'll leave it there. Any questions? before we break up and get warm. Thank you. <laughs>